welcome to episode 18. Hey, this is John Lee Dumas of EO Fire, and you're listening to Who Did That Voice, where we take an in-depth look at voiceovers. The holiday season is upon us, and there is no time like the present to book your holiday getaway with 3D Travel Company. Whether you want to set sail on the high seas or visit exotic and foreign locales, maybe your dream is to see a magical mouse, or maybe you long for a getaway that will universally appeal to all. For a limited time, my listeners receive a Disney gift card with qualifying Disney vacation purchases booked and traveled by the end of 2016. For more information on booking any of these trips, go to 3dtravelcompany.com and tell them Trenton sent you. Welcome to Who Did That Voice, the show where we take an in-depth look at voiceover. And now, here's your host, Trenton Larkin. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the first Halloween special on Who Did That Voice. As tonight is Halloween, Trenton has asked me to step in to help introduce you to the voices of our special guest, Neil Ross. One of the most iconic roles Neil has ever played is the Green Goblin. The exploding gas gave me great strength. And of course, the Hobgoblin's weapons were right there at Oscorp, right for the picking. But they no longer were meant for him. The gas saw to that. There was only one true goblin, the Green Goblin! <laughs> In the world of voiceover, not every character, like the Green Goblin, has an image that you can see, such as Neil's role in Back to the Future 2 as the Biff Tannen Museum announcer. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Biff Tannen Museum. Dedicated to Hill Valley's number one citizen and America's greatest living folk hero, the one and only Biff Tannen. If you happen to be a fan of the original Voltron, then you will be happy to know that Neil voiced both Keith and Pitch on the original series. There's only one way to rescue him, Voltron! Zarkon's here! He sure is. Get below! To the launch area! Into the Space Lions! In the year 1986, Neil Ross voiced a drunken Irish mouse named Honest John in Don Bluth's An American Tale. Look at me flower. It's me third wake today, and I'm not finished. We've got to do something about them cats. Ah. Besides paying Warren T. Rat for no protection. <clears throat> oh, oh, poor lad. So young. Never had a chance to vote. Well, he'll vote from now on. I'll see to that. Now, what is it that Trenton says? Sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Who Did That Voice? Today on the show, we have Neil Ross joining us. Neil, thanks so much for coming on the show. Oh, uh, my pleasure. I just, uh, I'm just turning my phone down in case it rings. Oh, no problem. No worries. <laughs> yeah. They only call when I'm doing something. When I'm sitting here looking at uh, contemplating my navel, I never hear from anybody. But as soon as I get involved in something like this... Hey, uh, listen, you want to talk? Well, not really. <laughs> That's fantastic. Uh, just comp contemplating your navel. I like that. <laughs> well, there's a lot of navel gazing around here these days. <clears throat> I don't know why. I suppose it's, uh, you know, getting into my seventh decade. Wow. Goodness. Yeah. Well, Neil, the very first thing we always like to do is just to get kind of a background on who our special guest is, and also, how did you break into the voiceover industry? Uh, well, you mentioned Michael Bell. I was walking through Burbank, and I saw this uh, 
book of matches and I picked it up and there was Michael's picture and it said, uh, can you draw my voice? If you, if you can, you may be uh, successful in voiceovers. I'm only having you on. I don't, you're probably too young to remember that. They used to have these uh, courses you could sign up for to become an artist. Oh, wow. And it would say, can you draw this face? If you can, you may have talent. <laughs> and amazingly enough, everybody who submitted had talent. Amazing. <laughs> yeah. No, uh, uh, enough with the uh, alleged comedy. I started out as a disc jockey. Okay. And I did that for about 20 years. Now, some of those years overlapped with the voiceover career. Okay. Uh, but that, that was really the beginning. Well, there's a whole long backstory, but as I progressed in radio, I began to discover that my talent seemed to lie more in the production studio than the air studio. And the production studio, for those who are not familiar with the radio business, is where all the commercials and the promotional announcements and the sweepers and what have you are created. And uh, I just seem to have a flair for that. And I, most, of, most of the radio people that I worked with didn't like that kind of work. They, it bored them, and it, it was too much like work. You know, the glamour part was being on live. Yeah. But I found that it was kind of interesting uh, to get do-overs, to really work hard at something, try to find exactly the right background music, and then create a read that fit that background music, and create something that, that really you ended up being relatively pleased with. And then, unlike live radio, which is like writing on water, it's gone the instant it happens, uh, these commercials and promotional announcements would play over and over and over again, sometimes for months on end. So I found that kind of gratifying, which sort of teed me up in the direction of voiceovers. I really didn't know who those people were who I heard doing the voices on national television commercials, national radio commercials, people narrating documentaries, people voicing animated shows. I, ju I just wondered, what's the deal with this? And in those days, nobody had ever heard of voiceovers. I certainly hadn't. And uh, then one day I did hear about it and discovered to my delight that this business existed and that you could actually make a living doing this and sometimes a very good living. And that's when I began to plot and plan to make the transition out of broadcasting and into voiceovers. Well, that's fantastic, Neil. I really appreciate you sharing kind of that background story of uh, how you got into voiceover. You know, I know you've done a lot of different things with your voice, including video games. Uh, and you've been able to play Han Solo from Star Wars in both Rogue Squadron and Star Wars Rebellion. Those are two of the titles that I know for sure that you played Han in. And what was it like for you getting to play such an iconic character from the Star Wars world? You know, it's it's funny. The I'm trying to remember. I don't think I, I was aware that I was actually... They never asked me to match Harrison Ford or, or, or you know, make any attempt at that. Uh, why I got picked for those, I, I just don't know. But uh, the, the, nobody... I don't think the, the name Harrison Ford came up at any of the recording sessions, nor was there any suggestion that I change what I was doing. Uh, to in any way match his voice. So it was pretty much just another day at the office, you know? Absolutely. Yeah, and I know a lot of times in those earlier games, you know, they weren't wanting necessarily the actors to match, like you were saying, the character's original voices, but to just be the essence and the body of what that character was, which I really do feel you had. You have that, you know, spunky, you know, bounty hunter kind of attitude and that that gruffness to your voice like he did and it's not Harrison Ford it's your own version of Han Solo mm -hmm. but I really liked it I really did so well that happens a lot in voiceovers you will see uh, get a piece of copy and they'll say well he's sort of uh, Joe Pesci crossed with uh, Marlena Dietrich which is really helpful <laughs> and um, it isn't that they want someone to come in and do an impression of Joe Pesci or whoever they've put out there as their prototype. It's just sort of give us that attitude, give us that feel. That's what we want more more than a, a an impression. Absolutely. Well, briefly, you had mentioned, Neil, you were kind of like, you know, 
listening to all these different ads and things on TV and stuff and hearing different voices doing narration, uh, you did do some narration yourself as well on both Back to the Future 2 uh, at the Biff Tannen Museum and Gremlins 2, the new batch for the fictional company they created called the Clamp Cable Network. And that was fantastic to to realize you did those voices because both of, both of those TV series or movie series, I'm sorry, uh, are shows that I absolutely love. And for me to realize that you are the voice of those narrators, that was fantastic. Yeah, it's it's a funny thing. You, you don't think about it at the time. I mean, it's obviously a thrill to be involved with a major motion picture, but, you know, years go by and, and things get forgotten. Uh, but no, the Back to the Future, uh, the Biff Tannen Museum is marvelous. People reference that constantly. And of course, when you bring up narration, I am particularly proud of having done about 25 Novas for public television, which was a show that I was a huge fan of starting in the early 70s. And, uh, you know, in those days I was a lowly uh, disc jockey in San Diego, California. And if you had suggested to me that I might have a shot at narrating uh, Nova one day, I would have said, uh, you need to be put in a rubber room. (laughs) But But it came to pass. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I mean, it's amazing, like, you know, looking back at all this, you know, it's like I've loved Back to the Future my whole life. I've loved Gremlins. And then to realize, wow, I'm going to be able to speak to the guy who did those voices. That's just kind of mind blowing. (laughs) My favorite thing in Gremlins, too, is I was the voice of the men's room. Oh, wow. Really? Which I've always thought I should put on a resume just so some casting person could say, excuse me, I think there's a mistake here. You say you played a men's room? You mean you played a man in a men's room? No, ma'am. I played the men's room, the entire men's room. I'm very versatile. <laughs> wow. So like all the commotion and voices going on in the room or? Well, it uh, you know, it's been years since I saw the movie, but a, a fan came up to me and he, he said he and his brother watched that movie uh, compulsively over and over again. And they loved the men's room scenes and they used to do the lines to each other. The only ones he quoted were, I guess when the character goes in, you hear me saying, Hi, mister, and welcome to the men's room. And then as he leaves, I say, Hey, did somebody forget to wash his hands? (laughs) Kind of like an automated voice. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It's been a while since I've seen it, so I don't recall that exactly, but it's kind of coming back to me. (laughs) Well, um, back in 1992, you were cast as Krista's father from Fern Gully, The Last Rainforest. And what was it like working on that show with the late and great Robin Williams, who voiced Batty? Well, of course, I never met the late and great Robin Williams. So, uh, okay. you know, it, a lot of the feature films, they either work you separately or in some cases, and I'm thinking this was the case with uh, Fern Gully. It's so long ago. Yeah. Uh, I think they brought four or five of us who were doing smaller roles in and they and they and they worked us all together. But we, we were not involved with any of the celebrity cast members. Okay. Well, and at this point, I would consider you a celebrity cast member, but back then you were kind of newer to the industry, I guess. Well, when I say celebrity, I'm talking about people like Robin Williams, who I have, you know, the ultimate respect for. And I've I've often said if he'd never become a movie star, he would have been one of the great voiceover performers of all time. But, you know, I have not been in television series. I have not appeared in movies. Uh, I am not a celebrity I, in a small way to fans of the animation world and the game world. Yes, perhaps I am a quote unquote celebrity, but I am not a, a movie or a television star by any stretch of the imagination. Well, back in 1986, you played one of my favorite characters uh, from a show that it's, it's been very iconic to my family growing up. You played Honest John on An American Tale which was directed by Don Bluth. Um, and for those of you who don't recall the name American Tale, it was about the little mouse Fievel and mm-hmm. his family that came from Russia, uh, just for the listeners that might not know that show. Um, and what was it like working on that animated film, Neil? Well, I'm very proud of, of having done that, that motion picture. And um, it, uh, it was produced by Steven Spielberg, And I think I'm correct in saying it was the first time he was ever involved in animation in any way, shape, or form. And at the time, 
uh, uh, motion picture animation was dead. Nobody was doing it. Uh, once in a while, Hanna Barbera would put a movie together based on one of their Saturday morning shows, and it would play in limited release, maybe only on weekends, maybe only in the mornings, uh, you know, strictly going for the kid audience, and that was it. Yeah. And it might gross uh, 10 million, you know, I, I don't mean, mean to make that sound like it's chump change, but compared to, you know, the, the major live action movies, it wasn't much. And that was pretty much all that was going on. And then uh, Don Bluth came along and got involved with Mr. Spielberg, and they did a, this movie, American Tale. Now, this doesn't sound like much in today's money, but remember this was the early 80s, I think, or the mid-80s? Yes, 1986. It grossed just shy of $50 million. Wow. And suddenly the business said, whoa, there's a few bucks in this, uh, this animation game. And uh, shortly thereafter, Steven Spielberg went ahead and put together Who Framed Roger Rabbit, and various other people got involved. Disney suddenly started up again. Uh, Spielberg and two other chaps formed uh, their own animation company, and uh, suddenly you had this explosion of, uh, of, of motion picture animation. And I'm, even though it's been forgotten, the whole thing was triggered by the success of An American Tale, which I still think is a wonderful movie. Oh, absolutely. It holds such a good place in my heart, and I know in my father's heart, it was kind of something he raised us on and we grew up with loving. And I didn't realize it had sparked such a uh, renaissance, in essence, uh, of animated films, which that's fantastic to hear because it is such a good quality piece of uh, feature film for an animation. It really was. It was a wonderful story, and the whole thing, uh, it was just a, it was a Cinderella story, both as a movie and, and the plot of the, uh, of the thing. And um, yeah, as I say, I'm, yeah, it's one of the high points of my career, although sadly it's kind of uh, been forgotten. Yes, I do think it has kind of faded into uh, the past, but hopefully this episode will kind of reinvent people's imaginations to go out and check it out and uh, check out Ameri uh, check out An American Tale. I can't even talk today. <laughs> in fact, I have in my room a gigantic poster for the movie, which was signed by uh, uh, both Don Bluth and Steven Spielberg. And Oh, that's fantastic. So that's there to remind me. I don't know about the rest of the world, but... Absolutely. Well, could you just briefly tell us, Neil, what was Honest John's character? What was he like on the show? Oh, yeah. Well, so I got this uh, call from my agent, and she said, there's some kind of animated project, and they're looking for a, a, somebody to play a drunken Irish mouse, and I thought of you. <laughs> and I said, all right, send me the sides, which is what they call the pages from the script. And she said, well, there are no sides. They just want you to make something up and send it to them. This is way before the internet or any of this stuff. I had this little home studio and I could record things on reel-to-reel -reel tape. Anybody wow. remember that stuff? <laughs> <clears throat> and I said, there's no script? Which I later found out is sort of standard operating procedure uh, for Steven Spielberg. He doesn't, he, he's real concerned about his ideas being ripped off. And so a lot of times they'll use a script from something else to audition actors. Uh, rather than show them the script that they're working on. At least that was the case back then. So, but I just, I got irritated. I thought, well, if they can't even be bothered to send me a script, you know, why should I even do this? And I, uh, looking back, I'm going, boy, what an idiot I was. But I, I just sat on the thing for about a week, did nothing. And my agent called, have you sent that? Well, all right, okay, I'll do it. <laughs> And I, ban I made up some, con oh, they said he was a politician, so I made up this convoluted uh, political speech and, and just, you know, did this Irish voice and hey, he sounded a little drunk and I, <gasps> you know, it's been a while since I've done it. <laughs> and I thought, well, here goes nothing. And I, I walked down to the post office and <laughs> put some stamps on it and mailed it thinking, well, I, I'll never hear the, uh, about this again. And to my amazement, about two weeks later, she called and said, well, you're in, kid. Wow. That's yeah. fantastic. I almost, I almost didn't send the audition in. I was, I was grumpy. Mr. Spielberg can't give me a script. Well, maybe I can't give him an audition. <laughs> what was I thinking? 
Well, I'm glad that you did end up sending that tape because it was uh, fantastic to hear you as that character. And I never realized it was you until more recently. Um, but that whole show, the cast of characters and the actors that were put into that movie were just fantastic people. So, Yeah, that was one of the last uh, feature films where it wasn't all celebrity driven. I mean, there were people who were celebrities in it, but there were also a bunch of us uh, regular folks and... Uh, I think they cast more with an eye toward or an ear toward what they wanted to hear as opposed to uh, how many Twitter followers do you have? <laughs> Absolutely. I understand what you're saying. It was a different time as well. You know, social yeah. media wasn't yeah. around like it is today. There wasn't really probably even the Internet really back then, I don't think. No. Um, so no. it was a very... Uh, well, it was an internet, but it was two guys in a basement. <laughs> it was uh, somebody in his garage. Very, uh, very beginnings of it, if, if anything, huh? <laughs> well, you know, aside from playing an American Tale, you were also on a TV series that has a big following uh, of people that listen to my show and I know just around the world, which was Voltron from 1984. And you played both Keith, the Black Lion pilot, and mm -hmm. Pidge, the Green Lion pilot. Right. And what was it like being a part of that series and working with Michael Bell and, and working with Lenny? Well, of course, that show, I didn't work with anybody. That show was very unusual, and I've really only learned the backstory recently when I did a little research on it. Okay. Uh, it grew out of uh, th these two producers uh, bought three animated shows from Japan and with the idea of revoicing them in English and putting them on the air. Uh, but when they started to look at what they had bought, they realized for a number of different reasons they couldn't just do that. And they had to more or less go back to the drawing board, have people, believe this or not, write scripts, and then they would cull through all this footage they had to find scenes that would somehow fit these plot lines. Wow. It had to be like putting a jigsaw puzzle together backwards. It I can't, and thank God I wasn't involved in that part of the process, but <laughs> by the time we came along, uh, the video was, was already edited, the script had been written, and it was essentially like an ADR session, uh, which is where you replace dialogue in a movie uh, by matching the character's lips, except it wasn't even that. We saw no picture. You would get a script, and next to your line would be a number. 8.7, and that would represent 8.7 seconds. Somebody had sat there with a stopwatch and timed the character's lip movements, and you had 8.7 seconds to say the line. And they would accept 8.6 or 8.8, .8, but anything longer or shorter than that, you had to do it over again, which was at times very frustrating. You'd get the emotion you wanted perfectly, but you were now two seconds long. Well, how the hell do I shave two seconds and maintain that that emotion. But because we were working in this strange way, we couldn't work together as an ensemble. So they would just schedule us back to back. I would come in, Peter Cullen would walk out of the studio, say, how's it going? I'd say, good, Peter, how are you? I'm fine. And in I would go, and then I would leave, and Michael Bell would be coming in. How are you, Michael? I'm well, how are you? Thank you. So I didn't work with anybody except the director, Franklin Kofod, and the engineer, and that was it. But uh, it was a real thrill for me because this was the first big show I bagged, and I was essentially, I guess, the lead character. Yes. And for a jumped-up ex-disc jockey who didn't know if he could even do this kind of work, I mean, it was only a few years earlier that I'd, I had sat in an apartment in San Diego watching Saturday morning animation and one minute thinking, well, I could do that, and then two <laughs> seconds later thinking, are you kidding? They'd throw you out in, you know, half a second. And I sort of thought, wow, maybe I can do this. I mean, I'm booked on this big show that's going to go 125 episodes, and you know, maybe I'm going to be all right. Absolutely. Well, I mean, it has a huge following, and they have revamped the show several times and uh, kind of reimagined it several different ways. Uh, but it is a show that has a huge following, and you were the leader of the team. Um, and uh, you just brought a good voice to it both your characters and they're so distinctively different that I was like you've got to be kidding me he was both voices like it it blew my mind <laughs> yeah well the the 
I've talked about this before. The uh, the Keith voice was sort of um, <clears throat> there was a wonderful actor named Richard Crenna. Uh, he's passed away, but he probably was best known. He was in the Rambo movies. He was Rambo's old military boss, Colonel Troutman. Yeah. And he started out as a, as a kid in a, in a show called uh, Our Miss Brooks. It was a radio show, and he played a high school student, Walter Denton. And he would say, gosh, Miss Brooks, I don't know what I'm going to do about the algebra test. You know, <laughs> and I loved that show as a kid. I never missed it. And I started to develop this voice I called Tommy Teenager. And it was sort of Walter Denton, but without the grit. It was, uh, you know, just up in here and really eager and excited. And I'm about 19 years old. And gosh, I can't wait to go to the prom. Well, I'm, I guess I'm too old to go to the prom. I'll get arrested. But anyway, that was, <laughs> that was the Keith voice. And the Pidge thing, again, remember, I'm very new to the business. Yeah. And, uh, easily thrown at this point and I show up for the first session and Franklin says oh I'm going to need you to do this other voice and he shoves this picture in front of me and it's this little elf like guy dressed in green with glasses he says what do you got for that and I just went into the total panic mode you know it's, yeah. I, I, don't I have two weeks to go away and think about this you want something now and yes I do and so I, I don't know. I said, well, what about, you know, something like this? He's perfect. And I thought, well, it's a one-off. It'll be in one episode. And then, and of course, it turns out to be another major character. I think he was in every episode. And, yeah. And then the funny stuff started. It, it, <laughs> it turned out at the production company, when they started getting the voice tracks in, everybody hears what we're doing. And everybody starts doing Pidge in the office. Wow. And Franklin told me, he says, the funny thing is they all think they can do it better than you can. <laughs> and I said, well, I don't understand that. I mean, I'm the standard, right? I'm doing it. How do you do it better than what I'm doing? Well, they think they can. I said, well, keep them out of here. <laughs> keep them out of here. <laughs> keep, keep, them, keep them in the office. Don't bring them in the studio because maybe they're right. <laughs> yeah. Hey, they are better. Let's replace him. <laughs> <laughs> Wow, that's funny. So Pidge was just a real big hit for everybody. Yeah, a lot, a lot of people, uh, like I say, he said it's catching. Everybody in the office is now doing it. So, Well, that's wild. <laughs> so do you, did people really, did they realize that you were doing both voices? Or was it kind of one of those things that people were surprised when they actually were like, hey, why well, I didn't know? I don't know. Obviously, the people in the office knew. Yeah. You know, they would have access to that information. As far as the um, the viewers, I, I don't know. I, You know, the credits go by. I used to joke, and you probably don't even know who I'm talking about, but the credits go by so fast. I say the only person who could possibly know who's in this show is Evelyn Wood. She was a woman who <laughs> gave speed reading classes. Her name sounds really ago. familiar. Yeah, it was the Evelyn Wood Speed Reading School or something. I, I don't remember, but it, yeah, I said, she's the only one who, who will have any idea who's in this show because the credits go by so fast. <laughs> well, that is fascinating, and uh, I'm glad we got to discuss that about Voltron because I do have a lot of people that listen to my show who are huge fans, and they will go crazy to know that we uh, were able to discuss uh, the times and the characters that you played. So I appreciate you going into that with us, Neil. Hey, no problem. No problem. I I have a special affection for that show because, as I said, it was the first big job I ever bagged in animation, and uh, you kind of never forget something like that. Most definitely. Well, you know, speaking of different shows that you've done, you were also a part of Spider-Man and his amazing friends mm -hmm. back, back in 1981. You played Cyclops, Wolverine, Norman Osborn, and Scorpion. Uh, and that was an amazing show. I grew up loving those shows. And later you reprised your, well, not reprised, but you came back to Spider-Man, uh, the franchise, back in 1994 when they released the new show Spider-Man as the Green Goblin, who is by far my most favorite villain uh, and uh, I think my absolute favorite voice you've ever done. How did that all work out and how did you get brought back to come on and be a part of Spider-Man again? I really didn't get brought back. In fact, Sometimes if you've played the part before, that's the kiss of death, because when they reboot something, they want it to be completely different from what came before. 
And they had me in to read for Norman Osborne and the Green Goblin, and I just, nobody asked me. I wouldn't have lied about it, but I wasn't about to volunteer the fact that I had done it before. Yeah. And after we were a few episodes in, the director said, yeah, somebody told me you in the other, and I said, well, yeah, but just a couple of episodes, you know. Mm, okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> but... Uh, yeah, that the, the Green Goblin. I I remember I would I would come in and I would I would do the first couple of lines absolutely flat out. I would have sworn a hundred and ten percent. I've given myself a headache. If you're looking at me, my face is purple and veins are throbbing in my forehead. And you're, this guy's gonna have an aneurysm. And the director would go, "Okay, that's the general idea, but we we're gonna need a lot more energy." <laughs> <laughs> Okay. But, uh, you know, the finished product uh, sounded pretty good, so I guess it was worth it. Absolutely. I would fully agree. He is uh, he is by far one of the most sinister villains, I think, is, who has ever been done on Spider-Man, in my opinion. So I really enjoyed it. <laughs> well, thank you. I appreciate it. It's, it's, it's one of the ones that I'm fond of, um, largely because it's one of the ones that uh, the fans remember and, and want to hear about. So. Absolutely. Well, you've played on a numerous amount of shows, shows that we haven't even had time to talk about today, but we would love to have you back on the show so that we could talk about more on the next episode, if that's ever possible. Um, but what is your favorite cartoon character from growing up, Neil, and why? You know, it's a funny thing. I, uh, I was raised in, in, in Montreal, Canada, and I won't bore everybody with the reasons why, but the uh, children under 16, it was very tough for them to go to the movies in those days uh, because of regulations. And uh, we didn't have a television set. So I saw virtually no animation. Uh, my favorite stuff was all radio and records. And uh, two things that were huge influences on me were a radio show from England, the BBC, called The Goon Show, okay, which, which you can find out about online. Now, goon in, in, in this country means a guy who breaks your legs because you didn't pay your gambling debt. In England, it means more like a fool or an idiot. Okay. If we, we would call it the idiot show, I guess, in the, in the, in the States. Uh, it was just three guys, one of whom was a very young, unknown uh, actor named Peter Sellers, who later went on to be a huge movie star in the Pink Panther movies and various other films, and a, a brilliantly inventive uh, comedy writer named Spike Milligan. And you would have to, you know, you either got this show or you didn't. And I got it big time. And I began to become aware that this guy, Peter Sellers, was doing about 15 to 20 different characters. And what I loved about I was just a kid, but I, I knew this instinctively. They weren't just funny voices. They were so damn real. He didn't just trick his voice up. He acted these, these various characters, and you could see them in your mind's eye. They existed. And that was a huge influence. And uh, all the guys in Monty Python have said uh, that this show was a huge influence on them. They've gone as far as to say, no goon show, no Monty Python. It's that simple. Wow. So I would invite your listeners to, uh, to Google The Goon Show, and you can find episodes online and uh, see what you think. Uh, the other th thing was a, a, an actor, an a actor. He was an actor, director, producer, writer, a direct, you know, on and on and on and on, uh, a guy named Peter Ustinov. And he could do dialects and characters, and he did a record called the Grand Prix du Rock, I think it's called, or the Race Around Gibraltar. I've forgotten the title. Isn't that funny? It was a huge influence. I can't remember the title. But anyway, <laughs> it's a satire of radio coverage of sports car racing, and he played every part in the thing, did all the sound effects, and I listened to that compulsively over and over and over again and st uh, stole from him shamelessly. But again, he, he ha had the same gift that, uh, Peter Sellers had, and it's what I always have striven to do in these animated shows, and that is not just do a trick voice, but to try to create a character that 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 you can visualize. Well, of course you can visualize it. There's a, a picture for you, but 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 make it a real person, not just a trick voice. 
That's what I'm always striving for when I work. And that's what these guys did. And that, those, that, those were my two huge inspirations. It wasn't until years later I would see a, the occasional cartoon and it would be, you know, some uh, Yosemite Sam or something with um, Mel Blanc. And uh, by then, I, you know, I was, I was a bit too old for that stuff. Yeah, I understand. Well, I appreciate you sharing that with us, you know, and, and I know not everyone had the opportunity to grow up watching animation, but I always like to ask that, or at least kind of like what you shared with us, what was the inspiration of, you yeah. know, kind of bringing you to where you came to in your life with voiceover and everything. So I appreciate you sharing that with us, Neil. Well, it's just, it's funny when I think about it, you know, when I work, I'm doing a radio show, you know, Absolutely. I like to think what I do, you could just listen to and you don't need a picture. And then if somebody wants to draw something, eh, fine. Be my guest. <laughs> <You know. laughs> as far as I'm concerned, I'm doing a radio show. Absolutely. And that's a great way to think about it. Well, I've got two questions for you, Neil, and we will wrap this interview up. The first one is, what advice would you give to someone who's interested in pursuing a voiceover career? Well, it's uh, it's getting tougher and tougher. The field is terribly crowded now. I mean, i you know, somebody said, what do you do for a while? Well, I do voiceover. Oh, no kidding. Uh, you know, my uncle's doing those, and so is my cousin, and I'm thinking of doing it. I'm going, oh, good. <laughs> so I'll do voiceovers. But, uh, you know, I would say perform anywhere, any way you can. Little theater, uh, if they're hiring an announcer at the bus station, go down and do that if you can. I mean, any kind of way you can use your voice in a performance uh, sort of arena uh, you know, disc jockeying helped me in a weird kind of way. Uh, just as I said, any kind of, uh, uh, work that you can do with your voice. And then of course, uh, voiceover workshops, if you can find good ones, uh, that's always very, very helpful. Just, just do involve yourself in as much as you can with your voice and hopefully things will go well. Absolutely. Neil, thank you so much for sharing that. And the last question I have for you is, what is the legacy that you want to leave behind? Oh, boy. Well, I would hope that in some way, uh, you know, it's, it, it's funny. I was talking to somebody else about this the other day. The, the number of people who have come up to uh, those of us who we haven't discussed these shows, but who are in Transformers and G.I. Joe and have told us how these shows inspired them and changed their lives. And you think think a cartoon show really but we have had people particularly gi joe i don't know if you remember that show oh absolutely yeah i grew up on that yeah. show yes sir and you remember the public service announcements you know how you know and knowing is half the battle we've had people come up and i'm not joking they've said listen i had a lousy childhood i was bullied uh, my father was this my mother was that uh, you guys raised me and I, you know, I, I tried to follow the GI Joe code and I've, I've done it my whole life. I was in the military. I was successful there. Now I have a successful career and blah, blah, blah. I have a wife and kids and it's all due to you guys. And, and we literally, we just sit there astonished, almost moved to tears. And, and, it, and, and we're very proud of, of it. We, you know, it, it sort of happened without, without us even realizing that it was going to happen. So that's a little bit of a legacy that I like. And the other legacy is, well, maybe I can inspire another performer the way the guys on the Goon Show inspired me, the way Peter Ustinoff inspired me. Maybe there's somebody out there going, boy, you know, this guy did, he did the Green Goblin and he was the announcer on the Academy Awards. Wow, that's what I want to do. And hopefully they'll get a chance to do it. Absolutely, Neil. I totally agree with you. I hope that today's interview and our chat together will inspire and motivate people to follow their dreams no matter the career path that they seek in their future. Well, Neil, it's been an absolute honor and pleasure to have you on the show today. Would you please just give us a closeout today as the Green Goblin? So this is Neil Ross saying what a pleasure it's been to appear on Who Did That Voice and always remember that I will get you eventually, Spider-Man! You okay? <laughs> I'm a very old green goblin. <laughs> well, Neil, I think I just got a hernia from doing that. <laughs> wow. <laughs> well, 
Well, thank you so much, Neil. It has been an absolute honor and pleasure to have you on the show. And thank you so much for giving us a closeout today as the Green Goblin from Spider-Man. Uh, my pleasure. My pleasure. Hey, everyone. Thanks so much for joining me for our first Halloween special. I hope everyone has a very fun and safe Halloween this 2016. If you enjoyed today's episode, I'd love to hear from you. Send me a message on my Contact Me page at www.whodidthatvoice.co. Well, everyone, that's all the time we have for this episode. Join us next week for our next special guest, Allison Packard. She has voiced Toodles the Cat on The Tom and Jerry Show, Robin from Space Racers, and Jabanyan from Yokai Watch. We'll see you then. Hey, are you ready to win some awesome prizes? All you have to do is like our Facebook page or follow us on Twitter for your chance to be instantly and automatically entered for your chance to win. Thank you for joining us today. We'll see you next time for more discoveries on Who Did That Voice. <laughs>